I want you to listen to these words from Luke 22, 19 to 23. It says this. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. When I read some of the things that the disciples thought and did, I sometimes ask myself, or yeah, just why don't they why don't they get this? Why are they so dense? Don't they get it by now? There are so many times that something is is staring them right in the face and they entirely miss it. Of course, every time I think this, I think God humbles me and points out uh, how I can often do the same thing and even sometimes worse. This is one of those instances where the disciples miss something that Jesus plainly lays out before them. See, right after passing the bread and the cup, Jesus shares that someone is going to betray him. The Gospel of John helps us to understand just how plainly he reveals his betrayer. Uh, if you, we were in John 14 just a second ago. If you'll look back just a few verses to John 13, verses 26 to 27, just for a moment. See, Luke leaves us with the disciples questioning who would betray Jesus. And John picks this up by uh, continuing with Peter signaling to John to ask Jesus who would do such a thing. So Jesus answers in verse 26 of chapter 3. It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now the Greek here is very specific. John uses this word baptizo to talk about uh, this dipping of bread. It means to immerse. And the word in the Greek, too, which means this. So if we put those two together, it says this. So when he had immersed this morsel, he gave it to Judas. See, Jesus had a very specific piece of bread in his hand. He held it up for the others to see. He told everyone what he was going to do with it, and then he dips that same piece of bread, and he gives it to Judas all in the presence of the disciples. He dips the bread, gives it to Judas, and then tells him to go do what he's going to do. And the disciples didn't understand. They are completely oblivious to the fact that Judas will betray Jesus, even though this plays out right in front of them. But that is the only, that's only the start of an entire night, actually a few days of confusion. See, we usually view the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, in a series of events. Jesus has the disciples prepare for the Passover. They have the Last Supper. Jesus predicts Peter's denial. They go to the Mount of Olives. Jesus prays. People come to arrest Jesus. Peter cuts off an ear. The disciples scatter. Jesus is before the religious leaders of Jerusalem, and so on. But after the Last Supper, and before all chaos breaks out, the Gospel of John reveals Jesus reassuring his disciples. He knows what is about to occur, occur, and the doubts that will inevitably come, and the dangers that will arise. And he wants them to know that not only does he know what's going to happen, not only is God in control of these events, but that he has plans for what will happen after the next few days occur, after death is conquered. So once Judas leaves, Jesus begins to give the disciples instructions and teachings to prepare them for what is to come. But they're having a very hard time understanding what he is saying. See, in John 13, verse 31, Jesus tells the disciples that it's time for him to be glorified and, and that he will not be around for a little while. Peter asks if he can go too, and Jesus tells him no, and that Peter will betray him three times. And then immediately after that, Jesus says this, in John 14, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. See, even though Peter just found out in front of the others that he would betray Jesus three times, 
he wasn't the only one who needed reassurance right then. The disciples did as well, as we, continue, as we see continuing through John 14. See, at the start of John 14, Jesus tells the disciples that he is going to prepare a place for them. And Thomas wants to know how to get there. Jesus essentially answers, through me. And truly, Jesus is the only way and the truth and the life. And no one can come through the Father except through him. Philip, though, not understanding that Jesus is talking about salvation, asks Jesus to show him the Father, and, and that will be enough for the disciples. Essentially, he's saying, I want to trust you, but I'm having a hard time. If you could just do this one thing for me, then I can know, and that will be enough for me to believe in you. And Jesus answers, you still don't know me, Philip? I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. See, we can do that too, can't we? We are on the edge of a pit or a, a precipice and we are looking into the great unknown and we pray to God and we say, I want to trust you, I do, but I'm not sure that I can. If you could just do this one thing for me, it will be enough to get me through this situation. For us and for Philip, we need to realize that this prayer, this, this statement, isn't faith and trust, it's bargaining. It's a business transaction. And Jesus pushes back on that and on Philip after telling him to believe that the Father is in Jesus and he is in the Father. He takes it a step further. See, not only should we believe that Jesus and God are one, Jesus and the Father are one, that everything is going to be okay, but continuing on in verse 12, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. See, Jesus is telling his disciples and us that it's not enough to merely believe in him. We must put that belief, that faith, that trust into action by doing what he is doing. He doesn't say, do what I did. He tells us to do the works that I do. For the disciples and for us, truly understanding that distinction will help us realize that Jesus is still working. He still has everything under control and still has a plan for tomorrow. Jesus says, believe and do. And then he reassures us again that if we need any help, to just ask him. Continuing on in John 14 and with verse 15 and on, it says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will not see me no more. Sorry, will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Again, to understand what Jesus is saying, we need to understand the context of what is about to happen. Jesus and the disciples are about to enter their darkest hour. Jesus will be crucified, and the disciples are going to flee and fear for their lives. It's going to seem like there is no hope, that there is no future, that there is no security whatsoever. The disciples will not only feel distraught and fearful, but even betrayal. Jesus was supposed to be the Messiah. The Messiah can't die. What were they going to do now? Jesus knows all of this, and he chooses this time to give them these reassurances, these promises, and these instructions. He's promising them help through the Holy Spirit. He's promising that he won't leave them as orphans, but he's coming back. He's promising that we're going to live because he lives. See, there's one resounding message in all of this that he's telling the disciples. He's telling them, Believe in me. Trust me. I've got this. In fact, look down at John 14, verse 27. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced. Because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. 
And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. In other words, trust me, I've got this. Still, the disciples did not understand, and when the shepherd was struck, the sheep scattered. And then, Jesus rose again. See, he proved that his promises were true. And just as he said in verse 29, they believed. Once again, Jesus was ascending into heaven. He tells us in Matthew 28 to believe, do, and trust. We should believe that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. We should do the work of making disciples, baptizing them, and teaching them. And we must trust him that he is with us always, even until the very end of the age. Believe, do, and trust. This is our call today, the same as it was the disciples' call in their day. And yet, too often, we are tempted to doubt, do nothing, and distrust our Savior. Now, we may want to say that we do believe, do, and trust, and that may be true. But today, let's really reflect on that. Do we really do we truly believe that Jesus is the Savior, that he is our substitutionary sacrifice, that he is God? Do we actually put that belief into practice outside of showing up to a building every Sunday for a few hours in the morning? Do we truly trust that he is in control, that he has a plan, that he is continuing to work in our lives? Put simply, is God Lord of our lives or are we Lord of our lives? Because if God is Lord of our lives and we lived in the truth of that, we would believe, do, and trust. The church would, would thrive. The community would never lack a witness of the gospel. We would never hesitate to go to the furthest reaches of the earth to share what we know, that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and that God, in his goodness and grace, is calling the lost to himself. If we believed, if we did, if we trusted, if God was Lord of our lives, that's what we would see. But if we are Lord of our lives, then our fruit would betray us. We would read our beliefs into the word. We would be content and make every excuse to let other people disciple, baptize, and teach. And when the going got tough, we would spiral into darkness because we would not trust in the promises and hope that Jesus graciously gives. If we are Lord of our lives, we are doomed. And so today we are encouraged to take, partake in the Lord's Supper, to take in communion, in remembrance. See, remembering what Christ went through for us, remembering that it was his body and blood that was given and shed for us, but most importantly, remembering that we can trust him. Even in the darkest of times, when there is nothing but darkness, we can trust him. When it looks like chaos reigns supreme, we can trust him. When it looks like there is no way out, that our very world crumbles around us, we can trust him. That's the reassurances he's giving in John 14. Knowing what he is about to go through, knowing what the disciples are about to go through, knowing the fear that they're about to have, he is telling them that they can trust him. The same message is for us too. Before we go through our darkest valleys, maybe we are in those darkest of valleys, we can know that we can trust him. And so let's examine ourselves today before we take communion. Eating the bread and drinking the cup signifies our belief in Christ, our action on that belief, and our trust in him. Will we eat and drink in a worthy manner? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and your message. We thank you for your reassurance that we can have peace with you, that we can live with you through, through the sacrifice that you've provided for us, through the salvation that you give us. I pray, Lord, that we would continue to trust in you. For those who are, are maybe on mountaintops or not necessarily in the valleys, but not necessarily on the mountaintops either, for those who are, all in the, who are also in the valleys, Lord, we just turn to you and pray that you would grow our trust in you, that you would help us to see that we can have our hope and faith in you, that you are walking with us through dark times, and that if we come up on another dark time in the future, you will be there with us as well.
And Lord, we help us to especially remember that and, and to grow in our trust of that as we are about to take of communion. Lord, may we take a, partake of it in a worthy manner, knowing that you've proved your faithfulness to us over and over again. We thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you for his death and resurrection. Help us to never take it for granted, Lord, but to reflect on it, remember it, and for it to change our lives. We pray this all, Lord, in your name. Amen.